amount of solar energy we're producing has been doubling, not every year, but every two years, for the last 20 years. And it's easy to dismiss these things, just as the internet was dismissed, or the Genome Project was dismissed, when it's only 1% or a fraction of a percent. But it is now uh, close to 1%, it's about eight doublings away from being 100% of our energy needs. Humans are better characterized not as the tool creating animal, maybe the only animal that has figured out how to outsource its cognition, how to spread its, its cognitive abilities into the outside world. We've only been doing that for a little while, like 10,000 years. Um, reading and writing is, is outsourcing of uh, memory. Um, and uh, if you notice more and more substitution of fragments of human cognition into the outside world, if the human responsibility becomes more and more focused on areas of judgment that haven't yet been automated, then what you're seeing is rather like a rising tide of this cognitive outsourcing. It took us 10 years to put out the first billion cell phones, three years to put out the second billion. We put out the last the third billion in the last 12 months, we'll put out another three billion in the next two years. Uh, these technologies ultimately become ubiquitous. And it does address poverty. Uh, the World Bank reported that the poverty rate in Asia has been cut in half over the last 10 years because of information technology. will be cut by 90% over the next 10 years at current rates. But I think any time you're contemplating um, something that can replace the most competitively effective feature that humans have, it's intelligence. It's entirely natural that there would be some real uneasiness about this. It is very unsettling to realize that we may be entering an era where questions like, what is the meaning of life, are practical engineering questions. There's no doubt that that should be very unsettling. On the other hand, uh, I think it might be kind of healthy if we sit down and look at the things we really want and look at what they would mean if we could get them. So I thank the scientists and uh, they said something that really surprised me and really has stuck with me. They said they didn't realize how interesting their work was. And I think, well, <laughs> they do this all day. I mean, it's got to be interesting to them. There, there's a real gap between what scientists do uh, and how they talk among e themselves about what they're doing and the rest of the world. And you know, I, I live there in that spot where that guy is flying through the air and trying not to crash. The, there, there is this, this gap, and I'd encourage you actually to, to join me there. Um, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's a somewhat hazardous place to be, but uh, there are a lot of benefits to, to trying to, to occupy that space in between science and the public. But here's the thing. You, you go out and you identify the stories that are important and, and speak to sort of a broader truth about the, the science itself. Super smart, but not social. I think it's a wide range of, of brains. You know, then you, someone like a person with Asperger's, which is biologist, was just on the far end of a continuum. And then you have very severe autism, where the child never learns to speak. You may have epilepsy and a whole piles of other problems. Now, there's also some research that shows the normal brain drops out of detail. And that's one of the problems that have for people to stay inside the belt way too long. They turn into these pod people. It's a brain's a fat weight. And one of the things that's a very, very big problem with a lot of the political stuff here inside the beltway is they totally get separated from the reality of whatever thing they're making policy about. Because the normal brain, when you get it away from practical things, loses detail. Here is a cost, I think, of the assumption of rationality that is made in economics. The assumption of rationality leads some economists to the conclusion that consumers do not need protection, that in general, people do not need to be protected against their own choices. You drop that assumption of rationality and then a new world opens up where, in fact, 
you do need to protect people against their decision and you need to ensure that the information that they receive is rich enough and clear enough to allow them to make sensible decisions in their own interest. The reason that all of this has happened is that some psychologists, and in particular Richard Thaler, whose name I mentioned, became interested in psychology, became interested in loss aversion, became interested in failures of rationality, and they could do economics with it. It's not the psychologists who have done the economics, it is economists. And the influence of psychology has been through these economists who found it interesting and enriching to give up some assumptions that were never very plausible.